Ice, William Wilson, by Edgar Allan Poe. Let me call myself for the present William Wilson. The fair page now lying before me need not be sullied by my real appellation. This has been already too much an object for the scorn, for the horror, for the detestation of my race, to the uttermost regions of the globe. Have not the indignant winds bruited its unparalleled infamy? O oh, outcasts of all outcasts, most abandoned! To the earth art thou not forever dead? To its honours, to its flowers, to its golden aspirations? And a cloud, dense, dismal, and limitless, does it not hang eternally between thy hopes and heaven? I would not, if I could, here or today, embody a record of my later years of unspeakable misery and unpardonable crime. This epoch, these later years, took unto themselves a sudden elevation in turpitude, whose origin alone it is my present purpose to assign. Men usually grow base by degrees. From me, in an instant, all virtue dropped bodily as a mantle. I shrouded my nakedness in triple guilt. From comparatively trivial wickedness I passed, with the stride of a giant into more than the enormities of an Elagabalus. What chance, what one event brought this evil thing to pass? Bear with me while I relate. Death approaches, and the shadow which foreruns him has thrown a softening influence over my spirit. I long in passing through the dim valley for the sympathy, I had nearly said for the pity, of my fellow men. I would fain have them believe that I have been in some measure the slave of circumstances beyond human control. I would wish them to seek out for me, in the details I'm about to give, some little oasis of fatality amid a wilderness of error. I would have them allow what they cannot refrain from allowing, that although temptation may have erewhile existed as great, man has never thus at least tempted before, certainly never thus fell, and it is therefore that he has never thus suffered. Have I not indeed been living in a dream? And am I not now dying a victim to the horror and the mystery of the wildest of all sublunary visions? I am the descendant of a race whose imaginative and easily excitable temperament has at all times rendered them remarkable. And in my earliest infancy, I gave evidence of having fully inherited the family character. As I advanced in years, it was more strongly developed, becoming for many reasons a cause of serious disquietude to my friends and of positive injury to myself. I grew self-willed, addicted to the wildest caprices, and a prey to the most ungovernable passions weak-minded and beset with constitutional infirmities akin to my own. My parents could do but little to check the evil propensities which distinguished me. Some feeble and ill-directed efforts resulted in complete failure on their part, and of course in total triumph on mine. Thenceforward my voice was a household law, and at an age when few children have abandoned their leading strings, I was left to the guidance of my own will and became in all but name the master of my own actions. My earliest recollections of a school life are connected with a large rambling cottage built and somewhat decaying building in a misty looking village of England, where were a vast number of gigantic and gnarled trees, and where all the houses were excessively ancient. In truth, it was a dreamlike and spirit soothing place, that venerable old town. At this moment in fancy I feel the refreshing chilliness of its deeply shadowed avenues, inhale the fragrance of its thousand shrubberies, and thrill anew with undefinable delight at the deep hollow note of the church bell breaking each hour with sullen and sudden roar upon the stillness of the dusky atmosphere in which the old fretted gothic steeple lay embedded and asleep. It gives me perhaps as much of pleasure as I can now in any manner experience to dwell upon minute recollections of the school and its concerns. Steeped in a misery as I am, misery alas only too real, I shall be pardoned for seeking relief however slight and temporary in the weakness of a few rambling details. These moreover utterly trivial and even ridiculous in themselves assume to my fancy adventitious 
importance as connected with a period and a locality, when and where I recognise the first ambiguous monitions of the destiny which afterwards so fully overshadowed me, let me then remember. The house I have said was old, irregular and cottage built. The grounds were extensive and an enormously high and solid brick wall topped with a bed of mortar and broken glass encompassed the whole. This prison-like rampart formed the limit of our domain. Beyond it, we saw but thrice a week, once every Saturday afternoon when, attended by two ushers, we were permitted to take brief walks in a body through some of the neighbouring fields, and twice during Sunday, when we were paraded in the same formal manner to the morning and evening service in the one church of the village. Of this church, the principal of our school was pastor, with how deep a spirit of wonder and perplexity was I wont to regard him from our remote pew in the gallery, as with step solemn and slow he ascended the pulpit. This reverend man, with countenance so demurely benign, with robe so glossy and so clerically flowing, with wig so minutely powdered, so rigid and so vast, could this be he who of late, with sour visage and a snubby habiliments, administered for rule in hand the draconian laws of the academy? O oh, gigantic paradox too utterly monstrous for solution! At an angle of the ponderous wall frowned a more ponderous gate. It was riveted and studded with iron bolts, and surmounted with jagged iron spikes. What impressions of deep awe did it inspire? It was never opened, save for the three periodical aggressions and ingressions already mentioned, then in every creak of its mighty hinges, we found a plenitude of mystery, a world of matter for solemn remark or for more solemn meditation. The extensive enclosure was irregular in form, having many capacious recesses. Of these, three or four of the largest constituted the playground. It was level and covered with fine hard gravel. I well remember it had no trees nor benches nor anything similar within it. Of course, it was in the rear of the house. In front laid a small parterre, planted with box and other shrubs. But through this sacred division we passed only upon rare occasions indeed, such as a first advent to school, or final departure thence, or perhaps, when a parent or friend having called for us, we joyfully took our way home for the Christmas or midsummer holy days. But the house how quaint nor building was this, to me how veritably a palace of enchantment, there was really no end to its windings, to its incomprehensible subdivisions. It was impossible at any given time to say with certainty upon which of its two stories one happened to be. From each room to every other there were sure to be found three or four steps in either in ascent or descent. Then the lateral branches were innumerable, inconceivable, and so returning in upon themselves, that our most exact ideas in regard to the whole mansion were not very far different from those with which we pondered upon infinity. During the five years of my residence, here I was never able to ascertain with precision in what remote locality lay the little sleeping apartment assigned to myself and some eighteen or twenty other scholars. The schoolroom was the largest in the house, I could not help thinking in the world. It was very long, narrow, and dismally low with pointed gothic windows and a ceiling of oak. In a remote and terror-inspiring angle was a square enclosure of eight to ten feet, comprising the sanctum during hours of our principal, the Reverend Dr. Bransby. It was a solid structure with massy doors sooner than open which in the absence of the Domini we would all have willingly perished by the pain forte at Dur. In other angles were two other similar boxes, far less reverenced, indeed, but still greatly matters of awe. One of these was the pulpit of the classical usher, one of the English and mathematical, interspersed about the room, crossing and recrossing in endless irregularity, were innumerable benches and desks, black, ancient, and time-worn piled desperately with much bethumbed books, and so beseamed with initial letters, names at full length, meaningless gashes, grotesque figures, and other multiplied efforts of the knife, as to have entirely lost what little of original form might have been their portion in days long departed. A huge bucket, 
with water stood at one extremity of the room, and a clock of stupendous dimensions at the other. Encompassed by the massy walls of this venerable academy I passed, yet not in tedium or disgust the years of the third lustrum of my life, the teeming brain of childhood requires no external world of incident to occupy or amuse it, and the apparently dismal monotony of a school was replete with more intense excitement than my riper youth has derived from luxury or my full manhood from crime. Yet I must believe that my first mental development had in it much of the uncommon, even much of the outra. Upon mankind at large the events of very early existence rarely leave in mature age any definite impressions. All is grey shadow, a weak and irregular remembrance, an indistinct regathering of feeble pleasures and phantasmagoric pains. With me this is not so. In childhood I must have felt with the energy of a man what I now find stamped upon memory, in lines as vivid, as deep, and as durable as the exegues of the Carthaginian medals. Yet in fact, in the fact of the world's view, how little was there to remember. The morning's awakening, the nightly summons to bed, the connings, the recitations, the periodical half-holidays and perambulations, the playground with its broils, its pastimes, its intrigues. These, by a mental sorcery long forgotten, were made to involve a wilderness of sensation, a world of rich incident, a universe of varied emotion, of excitement, the most passionate, and spirit stirring. Oh le bon temps, que le cycle de feu. In truth, the ardency, the enthusiasm, and the imperiousness of my disposition soon rendered me a marked character among my schoolmates, and by slow but natural gradations, gave me an ascendancy over all not greatly older than myself, over all with one single exception. This exception was found in the person of a scholar who, although no relation, bore the same Christian and surname as myself, a circumstance, in fact, little remarkable, for notwithstanding a noble descent, mine was one of those everyday appellations which seem, by prescriptive right, to have been time out of mind the common property of the mob. In this narrative, I have therefore designated myself as William Wilson, a fictitious title not very dissimilar to the real. My namesake alone of those who in school phraseology constituted our set, presumed to compete with me in the studies of the class, in the sports and broils of the playground, to refuse implicit belief in my assertions and submission to my will, indeed to interfere with my arbitrary dictation in any respect whatsoever. If there is on earth a supreme and unqualified despotism, it is the despotism of a master mind in boyhood over the less energetic spirits, of its companions. Wilson's rebellion was to me a source of the greatest embarrassment, the more so as in spite of the bravado with which in public I made a point of treating him and his pretensions, I secretly felt that I feared him and could not help thinking the equality which he maintained so easily with myself a proof of his true superiority, since not to be overcome cost me a perpetual struggle, yet this superiority even this equality was in truth acknowledged by no one but myself. Our associates, by some unaccountable blindness, seemed not even to suspect it. Indeed, his competition, his resistance, and especially his impertinent and dogged interference with my purposes were not more pointed than private. He appeared to be destitute alike of the ambition which urged and of the passionate energy of mind which enabled me to excel. In his rivalry, he might have been supposed actuated solely by a whimsical desire to thwart, astonish, or mortify myself, although there were times when I could not help observing with a feeling made up of wonder, abasement, and pique that he mingled with his injuries, his insults, or his contradictions, a certain most inappropriate and assuredly most unwelcome affectionateness of manner. I could only conceive the singular behaviour to arise from a consummate self-conceit assuming the vulgar airs of patronage and protection. Perhaps it was this latter trait in Wilson's conduct, conjoined with our identity of name and the mere accident of having entered the school upon the same day, which set afloat the notion that we were brothers, 
among the senior classes in the academy. These do not usually inquire with much strictness into the affairs of their juniors. I have before said, or should have said, that Wilson was not in the most remote degree connected with my family, but assuredly if we had been brothers, we must have been twins, for after leaving Dr. Bransby's I casually learned that my namesake was born on the 19th of January 1811, a somewhat remarkable coincidence, for the day is precisely that of my own nativity. It may seem strange that in spite of the continual anxiety occasioned me by the rivalry of Wilson and his intolerable spirit of contradiction, I could not bring myself to hate him altogether. We had to be sure near the everyday a quarrel in which yielding me publicly the palm of victory, he in some manner contrived to make me feel that it was he who had deserved it, yet a sense of pride upon my part, and a veritable dignity upon his own, kept us always upon what are called speaking terms. While there are many points of strong congeniality in our tempers, operating to awaken me a sentiment which our position alone perhaps prevented from ripening into friendship, it is difficult indeed to define or even to describe my feelings towards him. They formed a heterogeneous mixture, some petulant animosity which was not yet hatred, some esteem, more respect, much fear with a world of uneasy curiosity. It will scarcely be necessary to say in addition that Wilson and myself were the most inseparable of companions. It was no doubt the anomalous state of affairs between us which turned all my attacks upon him into the channel of banter or practical joke, rather than into that of a more serious and determined hostility. But my endeavours on this head were by no means uniformly successful, even when my plans were the most wittily concocted, for my namesake had much about him in character of that unassuming and quite austerity, which while enjoying the poignancy of its own jokes, has no heel of Achilles in itself, and absolutely refuses to be laughed at. I could find indeed but one vulnerable point, and that lying in a personal peculiarity arising perhaps from constitutional disease, would have been spared by any antagonist less at his wit's end than myself. My rival had a weakness in the fossil or guttural organs, which precluded him from raising his voice at any time above a very low whisper. Of this defect, I did not fail to take what poor advantage lay in my power. Wilson's retaliations in kind were many, and there was one form of his practical wit that disturbed me beyond measure. How his sagacity first discovered at all was so petty a thing would vex me as a question I never could solve. But having discovered he habitually practised the annoyance, I had always felt aversion to my uncourtly patronymic, and it's very common if not plebeian praenomen, the words were venom in my ears. And when upon the day of my arrival, a second William Wilson came also to the academy, I felt angry with him for bearing the name, and doubly disgusted with the name because a stranger bore it, who would be the cause of its twofold repetition, who would be constantly in my presence, and whose concerns in the ordinary routine of the school business must inevitably, on account of the detestable coincidence, be often confounded with my own. The feeling of vexation thus engendered grew stronger, with every circumstance tending to show resemblance, moral or physical, between my rival and myself. I had not then discovered the remarkable fact that we were of the same age, but I saw that we were of the same height, and I perceived that we were not altogether unlike in general contour of person and outline of feature. I was galled too, by the rumour touching a relationship which had grown current in the upper forms. In a word, nothing could more seriously disturb me than any allusion to a similarity of mind, person or condition existing between us. But in truth, I had no reason to believe that this similarity had ever been made a subject of comment or even observed at all by our school fellows, that he observed it in all its bearings, and as fixedly as I was apparent, but that he could discover in such circumstances so fruitful a field of annoyance for myself, can only be attributed, as I said before, to his more than ordinary penetration. His cue, which was to perfect an imitation of myself, 
lay both in words and in actions. And most admirably did he play his part. My dress it was an easy matter to copy. My gait and general manner were without difficulty appropriated. In spite of his constitutional defect, even my voice did not escape him. My louder tones were of course unattempted, but then the key it was identical, and his singular whisper it grew the very echo of my own. How greatly this most exquisite portraiture harassed me, I will not now venture to describe. I had but one consolation, in the fact that the imitation apparently was noticed by myself alone, and that I had to endure only the knowing and strangely sarcastic smiles of my namesake himself. Satisfied with having produced in my bosom the intended effect, he seemed to chuckle in secret over the sting he had inflicted and was characteristically disregardful of the public applause which the success of his witty endeavours might have so easily elicited, that the school indeed did not feel his design perceived its accomplishment, and participate in his sneer was for many months a riddle I could not resolve. Perhaps the gradation of his copy rendered it so readily perceptible, or more possibly, I owed my security to the masterly air of the copyist who disdaining the letter, which in a painting is all the obtuse can see, gave but the full spirit of his original for my individual contemplation and chagrin. I have already more than once spoken of the disgusting air of patronage which he assumed towards me, and of his frequent officious interference with my will. This interference often took the ungracious character of advice. Advice not openly given, but hinted or insinuated. I received it with a repugnance which gained strength as I grew in years. Yet at this distant day, let me do him the simple justice to acknowledge that I can recall no occasion when the suggestions of my rival were on the side of those errors or follies, so usual to his immature age and seeming inexperience that his mortal sense, at least if not his general talents and worldly wisdom, were far keener than my own, and that I might today have been better and thus a happier man, had I less frequently rejected the counsels embodied in those meaning whispers, which I then but too cordially hated and too bitterly despised. As it was, I at length grew restive in the extreme under his distasteful supervision, and daily resented more and more openly what I considered his arrogance. I have said that in the first years of our connection as schoolmates, my feelings in regard to him might have easily ripened into friendship, but in the latter months of my residence at the academy, although the intrusion of his ordinary manner had beyond doubt in some measure abated my sentiments, in nearly similar proportion partook very much of positive hatred. Upon one occasion he saw this, I think, and afterwards avoided or made a show of avoiding me. It was about the same period, if I remember aright, that in the altercation of violence with him, in which he was more than usually thrown off his guard, and spoke and acted with an openness of demeanour rather foreign to his nature, I discovered or fancied that I discovered in his accidents here and general appearance a something first startled, and then deeply interested me by bringing to mind dim visions of my earliest infancy, wild confusion and thronging memories of a time when memory herself was yet unborn. I cannot better describe the sensation which oppressed me than by saying I could with difficulty shake off the belief that myself and the being who stood before me had been acquainted at some epoch very long ago some point of the past even infinitely remote. The delusion, however, faded rapidly as it came and I mentioned it at all but to define the day of the last conversation I there held with my singular namesake. The huge old house with its countless subdivisions had several enormously large chambers communicating with each other where slept the greater number of the students. There were, however, as must necessarily happen in a building so awkwardly planned, many little nooks or recesses the odds and ends of the structure, and these the economic ingenuity of Dr. Bransby had also fitted up as dormitories, although being the merest closets, 
they were capable of accommodating only a single individual. One of these small apartments was occupied by Wilson. It was upon a gloomy and tempestuous night of an early autumn, about the close of my fifth year at the school, and immediately after the altercation just mentioned, that finding everyone wrapped in sleep I arose from bed, and lamp in hand stole through a wilderness of narrow passages, from my own bedroom to that of my rival. I had long been plotting one of those ill-natured pieces of practical wit at his expense, in which I had hitherto been so uniformly unsuccessful. It was my intention now to put my scheme in operation, and I resolved to make him feel the whole extent of the malice with which I was imbued. Having reached his closet, I noiselessly entered, leaving the lamp with a shade over it on the outside. I advanced a step and listened to the sound of his tranquil breathing, assured of his being asleep. I returned, took the light, and with it again approached the bed. Closed curtains were around it, which in the prosecution of my plan I slowly and quietly withdrew. When the bright rays fell vividly upon the sleeper, and my eyes at the same moment upon his countenance, I looked, and a numbness, an iciness of feeling instantly pervaded my frame. My breast heaved, my knees tottered, my whole spirit became possessed with an objectless yet intolerable horror. Gasping for breath, I lowered the lamp in still nearer proximity to the face. Were these, these, the lineaments of William Wilson? I saw indeed that they were his, but I shook as with a fit of the ache, in fancying they were not. What was there about them to confound me in this manner? I gazed while my brain reeled with a multitude of incoherent thoughts. Not thus he appeared, assuredly not thus. In the vivacity of his waking hours, the same name, the same contour of person, the same day of arrival at the academy, and then his dogged and meaningless imitation of my gait, my voice, my habits, and my manner, was it in truth within the bounds of human possibility that what I now saw was the result of the habitual practice of this sarcastic imitation? Awe-stricken, and with a creeping shudder, I extinguished the lamp, passed silently from the chamber, and left at once the halls of that old academy, never to enter them again. After a lapse of some months spent at home in mere idleness, I found myself a student at Eton. The brief interval had been sufficient to enfeeble my remembrance of the events at Dr. Bransby's, or at least to effect a material change in the nature of the feelings with which I remembered them. The truth, the tragedy, of the drama was no more. I could now find room to doubt the evidence of my senses, and seldom called upon the subject at all, but with wonder at the extent of human credulity, and a smile at the vivid force of the imagination which I hereditarily possessed. Neither was this species of scepticism likely to be diminished by the character of the life I led at Eton. The vortex of thoughtless folly into which I there so immediately and so recklessly plunged washed away all but the froth of my past hours, engulfed at once every solid or serious impression, and left to memory only various levities of a former existence. I do not wish, however, to trace the course of my miserable profligacy, a profligacy which set at defiance the laws, which it eluded the vigilance of the institution, three years of folly passed without profit, but had given me rooted habits of vice, and added in a somewhat unusual degree to my bodily stature, when after a week of soulless dissipation, I invited a small party of the most dissolute students to a secret carousal in my chambers. We met at a late hour of the night, for our debaucheries were to be faithfully protracted until morning. The wine flowed freely, and there were not wanting other and perhaps more dangerous seductions, so that the grey dawn had already faintly appeared in the east, while our delirious extravagance was at its height. Madly flushed with cards and intoxication, I was in the act of insisting upon a toast of more than wanted profanity, when my attention was suddenly diverted by the violent, although partial unclosing of the door of the apartment, and by the eager voice from without of a servant, he said that some person apparently in great haste 
demanded to speak with me in the hall. Wildly excited with the potent Vindabarak, the unexpected interruption rather delighted than surprised me. I staggered forward at once, and a few steps brought me to the vestibule of the building. In this low and small room there hung no lamp, and now no light at all was admitted, save that of the exceedingly feeble dawn, which made its way through a semicircular window. As I put my foot over the threshold, I became aware of the figure of my youth about my own height, and habited in a white Casimir morning frock, cut in the novel fashion of the one I myself wore at the moment. This the faint light enabled me to perceive, but the features of his face I could not distinguish. Immediately upon my entering he strode hurriedly up to me, and seizing my arm, with a gesture of petulant impatience, whispered the words, William Wilson, in my ear. I grew perfectly sober in an instant. There was that in the manner of the stranger, and in the tremulous shake of his uplifted finger, as he held it between my eyes and the light, which filled me with unqualified amazement. But it was not this which had so violently moved me. It was the pregnancy of solemn admonition, in the singular low hissing utterance, and above all it was the character, the tone, the key of those few simple and familiar yet whispered syllables, which came with a thousand thronging memories of bygone days, and struck upon my soul with the shock of a galvanic battery, ere I could recover the use of my senses he was gone. Although this event failed not of a vivid effect upon my disordered imagination, yet it was evanescent as vivid. For some weeks indeed I busied myself in earnest inquiry, or was wrapped in a cloud of morbid speculation. I did not pretend to disguise from my perception the identity of the singular individual, who thus perseveringly interfered with my affairs, and harassed me with his insinuated counsel. But who and what was this Wilson? And whence he came? And what were his purposes? Upon neither of these points could I be satisfied, merely ascertaining in regard to him, that a sudden accident in his family had caused his removal from Dr. Bransby's academy, on the afternoon of the day in which I myself had eloped. But in a brief period I ceased to think upon the subject, my attention being all absorbed in a contemplated departure for Oxford, thither I soon went, the uncalculating vanity of my parents furnishing me with an outfit, and annual establishment, which would enable me to indulge at will in the luxury already so dear to my heart, to vie in profuseness of expenditure with the haughtiest heirs of the wealthiest earldoms in Great Britain. Excited by such appliances to vice, my constitutional temperament broke forth with redoubled ardour, and I spurned even the common restraints of decency in the mad infatuation of my revels. But it were absurd to pause in the detail of my extravagance. Let it suffice that among spendthrifts, as I outheroded Herod, and that given name to a multitude of novel follies, I added no brief appendix to the long catalogue of vices than usual in the most dissolute university of Europe. I could hardly be credited, however, that I had even here so utterly fallen from the gentlemanly estate as to seek acquaintance with the vilest arts of the gambler by profession, and having become adept in this despicable science, to practice it habitually as a means to increase my already enormous income, at the expense of the weak-minded among my fellow collegians. Such nevertheless was the fact, and the very enormity of this offence against all manly and honourable sentiment proved beyond doubt, the main if not the sole reason of the impunity with which it was committed, who indeed among my most abandoned associates, would not rather have disputed the clearest evidence of his senses than have suspected of such courses the gay, the frank, the generous William Wilson, the noblest and most liberal commoner at Oxford, him whose follies were but the follies of youth and unbridled fancy, his errors but inimitable whim, whose darkest vice but a careless and dashing extravagance? I have now been two years successfully busied in this way, when there came to the university a young Parvenu nobleman, Glen Dining, rich said report as Herodes Atticus, his riches too as easily acquired. I soon found him of weak intellect, and of course marked him as a fitting subject for my skill. I frequently engaged him in play, and contrived with a gambler's usual art, 
to let him win considerable sums, the more effectually to entangle him in my snares. At length my schemes being ripe, I met him at the chambers of a fellow commoner, equally intimate with both, but who, to do him justice, entertained not even a remote suspicion of my design. To give to this a better colouring, I have contrived to have assembled a party of some eight or ten, and was solicitously careful that the introduction of cards should appear accidental, and originate in the proposal of my contemplated dupe himself. To be brief upon a vile topic, none of the low finesse was omitted, so customary upon similar occasions, that it is a just matter for wonder how any are still found so besotted as to fall its victim. We had protracted our sitting far into the night, and I had at length effected the manoeuvre of getting Glendinning as my sole antagonist. The game too was my favourite ecart. The rest of the company, interested in the extent of our play, had abandoned their own cards, and were standing around us as spectators. The parvenu knew who had been induced by my artifices, in the early part of the evening to drink deeply, now shuffled, dealt or played with a wild nervousness of manner, for which his intoxication I thought might partially, but could not altogether account. In a very short period he had become my debtor to a large amount, when having taken a long draught of port, he did precisely what I had been coolly anticipating. He proposed to double our already extravagant stakes, with a well-feigned show of reluctance, and not until after my repeated refusal had seduced him into some angry words which gave a colour of pique to my compliance, did I finally comply. The result, of course, did but prove how entirely the prey was in my toils. In less than a single hour, he had quadrupled his debt. For some time his countenance had been losing the florid tinge lent it by the wine, but now to my astonishment, I perceived that it had grown to a pallor truly fearful. I say to my astonishment, Glendinning had been represented to my eager inquiries as immeasurably wealthy, and the sums which he had as yet lost, although in themselves vast, could not, I suppose, very seriously annoy, much less so violently affect him, that he was overcome by the wine just swallowed was the idea which most readily presented itself, and rather with a view to the preservation of my own character in the eyes of my associates, than from any less interested motive, I was about to insist preemptorily upon a discontinuance of the play, when some expressions at my elbow from among the company, and an ejaculation evincing utter despair upon the part of Glendinning, gave me to understand that I had effected his total ruin under circumstances which rendering him an object for the pity of all should have protected him from the ill offices even of a fiend. What now might have been my conduct, it is difficult to say. The pitiable condition of my dupe had thrown an air of embarrassed gloom over all, and for some moments a profound and unbroken silence was maintained during which I could not help feeling my cheeks tingle with the many burning glances of scorn or reproach cast upon me by the less abandoned of the party. I will even own that an intolerable weight of anxiety was for a brief instant lifted from my bosom by the sudden and extraordinary interruption which ensued. The wide, heavy, folding doors of the apartment were all at once thrown open to their full extent with a vigorous and rushing impetuosity that extinguished as if by magic every candle in the room. Their light in dying enabled us just to perceive that a stranger had entered, of about my own height, and closely muffled in a cloak. The darkness, however, was now total, and we could only feel that he was standing in our midst. Before any one of us could recover from the extreme astonishment into which this rudeness had thrown all, we heard the voice of the intruder. Gentlemen, he said in a low, distinct, and never-to-be-forgotten whisper, which thrilled to the very marrow of my bones. Gentlemen, I make no apology for this behavior, because in thus behaving, I am but fulfilling a duty. You are beyond doubt, uniformed of the true character of the person who has tonight won at a cut a large sum of money from Lord Glendinning. I will therefore put you upon an expeditious and decisive plan of obtaining this very necessary information. Please to examine at your leisure the inner linings of the cuff of his left sleeve 
and the several little packages which may be found in the somewhat capacious pockets of his embroidered morning wrapper. While he spoke so profound was the stillness that one might have heard a pin drop upon the floor. In ceasing, he at once departed, and as abruptly as he had entered, can I, shall I describe my sensations? Must I say that I felt all the horrors of the damned? Most assuredly, I had little time given for reflection. Most hands seized me upon the spot, and lights were immediately reprocured. A search ensued. In the lining of my sleeve were found all of the court cards essential in a cut, and in the pockets of my wrapper, a number of packs, facsimiles of those used at our sittings, with the single exception that mine were of the species called, technically, arondeers, the honours being slightly convex at the ends, the lower cards slightly convex at the sides. In this disposition, the dupe who cuts, as customary at the breadth of the pack, will invariably find that he cuts his antagonist an honour, while the gambler cutting at the length will as certainly cut nothing for his victim, which may count in the records of the game. Any outrageous burst of indignation upon this shameful discovery would have affected me less than the silent contempt or the sarcastic composure with which it was received. Mr. Wilson, said our host, stooping to remove from beneath his feet an exceedingly luxurious cloak of rare furs. Mr. Wilson, this is your property. I presume it is supererogatory to seek here for any further evidence of your skill. Indeed, we have had enough. You will see the necessity, I hope, of quitting Oxford, at all events of quitting instantly my chambers. Abased, humbled to the dust as I then was, it is probable that I should not have resented this galling language by immediate personal violence, had not my whole attention been at the moment arrested by the fact of the most startling character the cloak which I had worn was of a rare description of fur. How rare, how extravagantly costly, I shall not venture to say. Its fashion, too, was of my own fantastic invention, for I was fastidious, to a degree of absurd coxcombry, in matters of this frivolous nature. When, therefore, Mr. Preston reached me that which he had picked up upon the floor, and near the folding doors of the apartment, it was with an astonishment nearly bordering upon terror, that I perceived my own already hanging on my arm, and that the one presented to me was but its exact counterpart in every particular. The singular being who had so disastrously exposed me had been muffled. I remembered in a cloak, and none had been worn at all by any of the members of our party with the exception of myself, retaining some presence of mind. I took the one offered by Preston, placed it unnoticed over my own, left the apartment with a resolute scowl of defiance, and next morning, ere dawn of day, commenced a hurried journey from Oxford to the continent in a perfect agony of horror and of shame. I fled in vain. My evil destiny pursued me as if in exultation, and proved indeed that the exercise of its mysterious dominion had as yet only begun. Scarcely had I set foot in Paris ere I had fresh evidence of the detestable interest taken by this Wilson in my concerns. Years flew while I experienced no relief, villain at Rome with how untimely, yet with how spectral an officiousness stepped he in between me and my ambition, at Vienna too, at Berlin and at Moscow, where in truth I had not bitter cause to curse him with my heart. From this inscrutable tyranny did I at length flee panic-stricken, as from a pestilence, and to the very ends of the earth I fled in vain, and again and again, in secret communion with my own spirit, would I demand the question, who is he? Whence came he? And what are his objects? But no answer was there found, and I now scrutinised with a minute scrutiny the forms and the methods, and the leading traits of his impertinent supervision. But even here, there was very little upon which to base a conjecture. It was noticeable indeed that in no one of the multiplied instances in which he had of late crossed my path, he had so crossed it except to frustrate those schemes, or to disturb those actions which fully carried out might have resulted in bitter mischief. Poor justification this in truth for an authority so imperiously assumed. Poor indemnity of natural rights of self-agency, so pertinaciously, so insultingly denied. I had also been forced to notice that my tormentor, for a very long period of time, had so contrived it in the execution of his varied interference with my will, 
that I saw not at any moment the features of his face. Be Wilson what he might, this at least was but the virious of affectation or of folly. Could he for an instant have supposed that in my admonisher at Eton, in the destroyer of my honour at Oxford, in him who thwarted my ambition at Rome, my revenge in Paris, my passion and love at Naples, or what he falsely termed my avarice in Egypt, that in this my arch enemy and evil genius, I could fail to recognise the William Wilson of my schoolboy days, the namesake, the companion, the rival, the hated and dreaded rival, at Dr. Bransby's? Impossible. But let me hasten to the last eventful scene of the drama. Thus far, I had succumbed to this imperious domination, the sentiments of deep awe with which I habitually regarded the elevated character, the majestic wisdom, the apparent omnipresence and omnipotence of Wilson, added to a feeling of even terror, with which certain other traits in his nature and assumptions inspired me, had operated hitherto to impress me with an idea of my own utter helplessness, and to suggest an implicit, although bitterly reluctant, submission to his will. But, of late days I had given myself up entirely to wine, and its maddening influence upon my hereditary temper rendered me more and more impatient to control. I began to murmur, to hesitate, to resist, and was it only fancy which induced me to believe that with the increase of my own firmness, that of my tormentor underwent a proportional diminution, be this as it may, I now began to feel the inspiration of a burning hope, and at length nurtured in my secret thoughts a stern and desperate resolution that I would submit no longer to be enslaved. It was at Rome during the Carnival of 18 blank that I attended a masquerade in the Palazzo of the Neapolitan Duke di Broglio. I had indulged more freely than usual in the excesses of the wine table, and now the suffocating atmosphere of the crowded rooms irritated me beyond endurance. The difficulty, too, of forcing my way through the mazes of the company contributed not a little to the ruffling of my temper, for I was anxiously seeking, let me not say with what unworthy motive, the young, the gay, the beautiful wife of the aged and doting de Broglio, with a too unscrupulous confidence, she had previously communicated to me with the secret of the costume with which she would be habited, and now having caught a glimpse of her person, I was hurrying to make my way into her presence. At this moment I felt a light hand placed upon my shoulder, and that ever-remembered low damnable whisper in my ear, in a perfect whirlwind of wrath. I turned at once upon him who had thus interrupted me, and seized him violently by the collar. He was attired as I had expected like myself, wearing a large Spanish cloak, and a mask of black silk, which entirely covered his features. Scoundrel, I said in a voice with rage, while every syllable I uttered seemed as new fuel to my fury. Scoundrel imposter, accursed villain, you shall not, you shall not dog me unto death, follow me or I will stab you where you stand and I broke my way from the room into a small antechamber adjoining, dragging him unresistingly with me as I went. Upon entering, I thrust him furiously from me. He staggered against the wall I closed the door with an oath, and commanded him to draw. He hesitated but for an instant, then with a slight sigh drew in silence, and put himself upon his defence. The contest was brief indeed. I was frantic with every species of wild excitement and felt within my single arm the energy and the power of multitude. In a few seconds I forced him by sheer strength against the wainscoting, and thus, getting him at mercy, plunged my sword with brute ferocity, repeatedly through and through his bosom. In this instant, some person tried the latch of the door. I hastened to prevent an intrusion and then immediately returned to my dying antagonist. But what human language can adequately portray that astonishment, that horror, which possessed me at the spectacle then presented to view? The brief moment in which I averted my eyes had been sufficient to produce, apparently, a material change in the arrangements at the upper or farther end of the room. A large mirror now stood where none had been perceptible before, and as I stepped up to it in extremity of terror, my own image, but with features all pale and dabbled in blood, advanced with a feeble and tottering gait to meet me. Thus it appears I say, but was not. It was my antagonist. It was Wilson who then stood before me in the agonies of his dissolution, not thread in all the raiment, not a line in all the marks and singular lineaments of that face which was not, even identically my own, 
His mask and cloak lay where he had thrown them upon the floor. It was Wilson, but he spoke no longer in a whisper, and I could have fancied that I myself was speaking while he said, You have conquered and I yield, yet henceforward art thou also dead, dead to the world and its hopes. In me didst thou exist, and in my death. See by this image, which is thine own, how utterly thou hast murdered thyself. 